and welcome. Thank you so much for being here today and joining us for a conversation about housing and climate. My name is Jess Wallach. I'm an organizer with 350 Seattle, and I'm going to be co-moderating today's panel with Inye. Um, I'll just maybe really briefly introduce myself, give you a minute of context, ask Inye to do the same, and then we'll open it up to our panelists to introduce themselves. So part of why I was so excited to join you all at today's housing forum um, is that housing is something that I think a lot about. I came to this city uh, over a decade ago. My folks moved me out here, but I've stayed, and this place has become home in a way that both feeds me, and I'm actively invested in taking care of this place, the people in it, and the ways that um, I'm connected you know, deeply across this city. And at the same time, I'm not sure I can stay here. I'm a renter. My rent has more than doubled in the last decade, and I look around and wonder, what does it mean to have a future in this place? And what does it mean to have a future in this place that's aligned with the values around justice and equity that are really important to how I take care of this place. So my name is Inye Wakoma. Uh, I am a Seattle native. I um, was born at University Hospital and uh, grew up in the Central District. I uh, lived most of my life here in Seattle uh, with the exception of 10 years that I lived in Atlanta. And so, you know, I've witnessed firsthand um, the city go through many stages of of evolution and you know uh, I would say by far the past 10 or 15 years have been the most dramatic changes um, that I've seen not only here but uh, just about anywhere that I've traveled in my lifetime um, and so I continue to live in the central district um, which of course is a neighborhood that has changed radically over the past two decades and so the neighborhood that I grew up in is no longer the neighborhood that I live in um, and, you know, it's uh, increasingly challenging, you know, for me to, to be in the place that, um, that for my entire life that I considered home. Um, in many ways, uh, day by day, it feels less like home, um, but I'm not, uh, have not yet been compelled to, to leave. Um, so, you know, I'm facing the challenges of what does it mean to actually uh, have a home and be rooted and be able to stay and be able to face the challenges, you know, as a homeowner um, in, a, in a home that is uh, a legacy family home uh, that was passed down, um, being able to afford that and, and having that make sense in a new economic and social context. Thank you. I'm going to then just go to my left. So. Margaret Morales from Sightline. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself and take about five minutes? Oh, five minutes right now. We're doing this. We're yes. Oh. Yes, please. Okay. We'll, we'll go just one down, and that way everyone gets a chance to hear the panelists and their story. Okay, thank you for thank clarifying you. that. Hi, I'm Margaret. Um, I work at a small nonprofit here um, based in Seattle. It's called Sightline Institute. Uh, we're a sustainability nonprofit. And we think of sustainability pretty broadly from the perspective of the environment and also economic sustainability and social sustainability. I work on our housing and urbanism team. And I brought some visuals to kind of show the types of questions that we ask and think about at Sightline um, about housing. So I'm going to um, have a great volunteer upstairs helping me advance the slides so you can go forward one. So we think first about housing in terms of climate. What are the climate impacts of our housing policies? Um, so go ahead, one. This is some work that I did earlier this year. Um, I created this chart. It shows every dot on here is a census block group in the city of Seattle. And I sorted them from left to right according to the number of homes per residential acre in that census block group. So dots further to the left are areas that have relatively few homes per acre. And dots further to the right have more. So dots on the left are areas dominated by single family homes where there's a lot of space, there's yards between each home, not very walkable. The blue dots have a little more housing diversity. There's more townhomes there, more duplexes. Um, so a few more homes per acre. And the green dots are areas that have things like apartments. So that's what the dots mean. And then they're also sorted top to bottom um, by the typical driving behavior of an average household in that neighborhood. And we see that there is a very strong correlation between the layout of a neighborhood, how many homes are permitted per acre, 
and the carbon footprint of that neighborhood, how much driving they're doing. So to me, this chart shows some exciting opportunity, actually, because it doesn't take a lot to slide a neighborhood down that carbon slope, down that climate slope. Adding a few more housing options to a neighborhood um, really helps reduce driving from that neighborhood. So that's one type of thing we think about. Um, so the, another way that we look at housing questions in Seattle is through a lens of equity. So this is the um, redlining map that was in Seattle. Um, for people not familiar with redlining, it was, um, it was a federal policy, started in the 1930s, was applied to cities across the country. And the bottom line was it made housing loans, federally backed housing loans, more accessible to white households than to households of color. And the criteria, these um, maps were made of all the big cities in the country at the time. And if your neighborhood fell in a red or yellow area, that meant there were a lot of people of color living in your neighborhood, and it was hard to get a loan to buy a house there. And if you lived in a blue area, those areas meant it was mostly white households there. It's much easier to get a loan. So neighborhoods that were predominantly white had the benefit of receiving federal um, investment in their neighborhood. So that's, his, that's a little bit of history of housing policy here. It's no longer formal policy. But the fact is that it continues to impact our housing climate here. And here's how. OK, this is a map of Seattle public schools today, uh, public elementary schools. And I color coded each of them according to how students are performing at that school on standardized tests. So the schools that are in green, those students are performing above the state average on the tests. Schools that are red, those students are performing below average, and student, uh, yellow schools, they're performing about the average. Now, results on a standardized test, that is not the only way to understand school quality, but it's one metric, it's easily accessible, and you can do it across all schools. What's eerie to me is that this map lines up really well with the historic redlining map. You see those areas that historically were deprived of investment continue to struggle today with the schools. So that's something that we need to think about as we design housing policy. Yes, redlining no longer exists, but its, um, it's legacy does across our city. So I'm gonna take this one step further. Okay, so I took this school map and I overlaid it on our city's zoning map today. And I found something interesting. So I found that there's a disproportionate amount of land around those top schools falls in single family zoning today. So if you want um, around, so the attendance areas for those top schools, if you want your child to have the chance to go to one of those schools, you need to buy a single family home. In fact, around those schools, there are fewer rental options than in the rest of the city. And it's not just single family homes, it's the most expensive homes. So any family who wants the choice to send their child to one of those top schools has to be able to buy a very expensive home in this city. So that's a way that our current housing policy continues to exclude people from public amenities. One thing I'll tack on there, this does not mean that we don't have a responsibility to invest in the schools that have been deprived, but it's a both and solution, and people should have the choice to go to those schools. So I'll stop there and let you go. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Wilson, and um, I've lived in Seattle since 2004. Um, so my experience of the city really sort of co coincides with uh, the dramatic changes that have been taking place over the last um, 14 or so years. And uh, in 2011, um, a few years into the Great Recession, King County Metro was talking about having to cut um, bus service countywide by 17%, um, largely because of uh, sales tax revenues having plunged um, during the recession. And um, I and some other transit riders, activists, got together and we started the Transit Riders Union, uh, which I've now been organizing with for, I guess, the last seven years. Um, and 
uh, over the course of that time, you know, we've done a lot of work uh, to try to make public transit affordable and accessible to everyone. We helped to build a coalition that won the Orca Lift low income fare program that now tens of thousands of uh, transit riders throughout King County use um, to get around. And uh, we supported the Rainer Beach and Freedom School students uh, as they ran their fantastic campaign to win uh, free bus passes for low income public school students, which just this year has been extended to all high school students in Seattle. Um, we've done a lot of work on the King County, yes, yay, students. Um, <laughs> the uh, King County Human Services bus ticket program, um, organizing with service providers and some of our homeless organization allies like Real Chain, Share Wheel, Nicholsville, um, to make big improvements to um, transit access for very low income and homeless folks. Um, and as we've been doing all that work, we realized that you really can't separate public transit from other issues. Um, you can't separate it from issues of taxation, right? One of the big issues that we face in our city and our state is an extremely regressive tax system. So we're always uh, taxing working people, taxing poor people to fund public goods and services like transit. Um, and so um, in 2017, we sort of responded to that fact by um, partnering with the Economic Opportunity Institute and a bunch of wonderful organizations, including uh, 350 Seattle, to form the Trump Proof Seattle Coalition and uh, passed the, our state's first income tax in 80 years through the Seattle City Council, which is now making its way to the state Supreme Court. Um, and uh, you also can't separate public transit, of course, from, from housing. So as we were asking the question, can you afford bus fare? Um, th this other question came up, which is, can you even afford to live near a bus? And as housing prices have been rising and rising um, over the years, that question has really risen to the fore for many of our members um, who are you know, low income, many homeless. And um, so over the past couple years, we've really dived into housing and homelessness. Um, and starting last fall, um, we again partnered with a bunch of great organizations, including 350 Seattle and uh, built the Housing for All Coalition um, and uh, got deeply involved in the campaign for a, a progressive business tax, which you might hear called the head tax. And I'm sure you're all probably familiar with, with the fate of that uh, campaign. I decided to proudly rep my Bring Seattle Home Decline to Sign t-shirt, which I'm now re realizing is very bright and is probably blinding people out there. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, uh, and then uh, this summer, um, we put a lot of effort into um, the, this uh, fight around the King County lodging tax and um, with a bunch of other organizations succeeded in getting $165 million uh, additional directed to affordable housing from, from that source. Um, yeah. So some, some progress. Um, and yeah, so, so that's, sort of, that's sort of where I'm uh, coming from. And um, I think, and another reason I, I wore this shirt is though, although we lost this campaign, I think that as we're doing this work, it's really important not to be too dismayed by failure, you know, because we're trying to do hard things. We're going up against powerful forces, you know, really entrenched, you know, systems um, and, we got to be prepared to fail, and we're going to win, but we got to be prepared to fail a lot first. So. Wow, that was, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that failure part really got to me because this is one of the things that I'm afraid of most in, you know, most of my life. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hodan. I am, I guess, a Seattle native because I spent most of my life here. Um, I came to the United States in the early 2000s. Um, and I've like did the numbers and the calculations and I've lived in Seattle more than I've lived anywhere else in the world. Um, so I guess that's like a version of home, but you know, looking around and seeing the political climate and the actual climate, um, it's, it's it, you know, it's a little bit harder every day to see this place like home. Um, and I wanna really like what Inye said earlier about like growing up in a neighborhood and then like being, still living there, but seeing it change around you is something that I've been, um, dealing with a, with a lot, and I think one of the very first things that I got politicized around was the light rail, right? So 
um, in the in like 2009-ish, I think the light rail opened, and they were doing that whole like come ride for free for three days, and then you got to pay the rest of the time. Um, and I started to notice that the number of white people who were getting off in my stop was just like getting to be more and more and more and more. And at some point, like I just didn't have enough fingers on my hands and toes to count. Um, and it was really interesting for me because up until that point, my neighborhood had, I live in the Rainier Valley, had this um, reputation, right, that it's dangerous, that everybody over there are in gangs and they're thugs and there's all these sort of things. And, I've never felt that way about my neighborhood. I feel the safest when I'm there. Um, and I think maybe that has to do with a lot of us creating a community, a lot of people who look like me, a lot of people who um, have the same values as me, and maybe we don't all know each other, but we have each other's backs, that kind of thing that we created. Um, and that's n now that's no longer there, right? There's more and more neighbors that I don't know. Like, when did this person move in? Or what happened to that family that used to live here? Um, so I am, and that's kind of, as the years went on, um, I went to college, and did the whole like learning about racism through the classroom and being like, oh my God, these are all the words that I never had and all this like, just like a reservoir of anger in me that I didn't really have a name for, um, I started to name. So of course, I dove right in. I was like, that's it, I'm changing this. Everything's gonna be better. I'm gonna give it 10 years. <laughs> 10 years later, uh, let's say that I'm not exactly where I was. I think I've grown a lot as a person and I've dealt a lot with failure and a lot with, um, just realizing that the forces of capitalism and white supremacy and colonialism are like so entrenched in this country that me just like realizing 10 years ago that all these things existed might not change the things the way I wanted to change the things. Um, so I got to Guy Green um, uh, early 2015 and I came in a weird way where I was like talking to a friend of mine and I was like hey I kind of graduated and like found a job but it was only for a bit now I'm temping and I'm kind of bored with it like help me find work um, and as she was helping me look for jobs she also told me about um, she was working at Puget Sound Sage and is now back at working at Puget Sound Sage um, was, was talking to me about like a committee, a climate justice committee being, being put together with Guy Green and Puget Sound Sage and us like learning, talking more about climate change. And at that point I was like, um, I have bigger problems to deal with like poverty and police brutality. I don't really have time for climate change. I do appreciate you helping me with this, but I think I'll pass on this offer. Um, and she was like, okay, but it's a Sunday. You're not doing anything. There's, there'll be food. So at least just come and meet people. Um, of course, there's food. So like I went and I was like, I wanna see this. And the room, when I walked in, it felt like a place that I've been before. All these people that I've been organizing with for a really long time, friends of mine from college, people I just knew from community. And it then made me feel like, wow, this if all these people that I love and respect are, are thinking about this issue, uh, maybe there's something to it. So let me just sit through the meeting. Um, so I sat through the meeting and it just turned, it was one of those things where I was like, yes, these are the words that I've been looking for to associate with climate change so that I feel seen in this field of work. Um, and up until that point, it was only about polar bears and sea level rise and no one was talking about what happens when, this, when the sea level rise and how islands go underwater and entire cultures and people and homes go away, right? Um, so Guy Green and Peach Stan Sage helped me put words that make me feel like I belong here, right? Um, so I've been with Guy Green ever since. Um, I have I've, I've learned something new like every day, which is exhausting, but also super exciting because then I'm never like settled or bored, right? Um, because you know, I'm a millennial, things have to be changing or else I'm, you've lost me, right? Um, so um, right, right now we're working on, we've been working on a ton of things and the Climate Justice Committee have come a long way. Um, we did a survey asking our community what they thought about climate change and everybody gave the same answer that I was giving, standard uh, polar bears dying, sea level rise, and I think that's kind of it. Um, but when we asked, like, what, if anything, will make your communities healthier? What are you seeing in your communities? Folks are talking about, like, diesel trucks and, like, asthma and living on super fun sites and not having areas that have um, air conditioning because the summers are getting hotter. So all of these things that are, that are issues that are related to the earth's climate changing, but no one in that community seeing it that way because they don't see themselves in climate, which was something that was so amazing um, that I could just, then there were also like me asking them these questions were, was like a plot twist to their life because 
everybody who talked to me about climate change were always always white and older, right? So it like connected, it gave me an, an opportunity to disconnect. But when it was me and people who were from the committee, it was like an invitation to let's keep talking about this thing. Um, yeah, so we are working on housing, and I I don't want to like like launch and like answer the questions that are coming to me or coming to all of us. Um, but we also are looking at climate change and the impacts of climate change in a much more broader and more like connected ways, right? Like we're talking about um, like affordable housing that are that's healthy to live in. We're talking about transit that are near such places where you can live in, and good jobs that make that fulfill you as a person, but also pays you really well and helps you add to the whatever you have to give in the world. Um, and opportunities to be in the environmental field for work and get paid. Um, and um, food access, right? Like for families who um, have enough money to pay rent, but, but rent is so high, they don't have enough uh, money to pay for food, so they fall into the food insecurity gap. And how do we close that? And how do we close that with the sugary beverage tax and not let um, folks who are our elected officials um, <clears throat> use that money for something that's different. And that was, um, that was not to my friend here, it was to someone else. Um, so, right, so like just connecting all those things so that we create a whole like world that folks can live in and thrive in and not just survive in. And that's kind of why I do this work and why I'm here on a Saturday when I could be binge watching shows that I have already watched. That was amazing. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you again for the invitation to be here. I'm humbled to be up here. You can tell these are the organizations and you all, I recognize your faces in the audience. You are the people that are fighting for economic justice, environmental justice, racial justice. And for me, it's just an incredible honor to be up here uh, with these organizations and individuals and with all of you. I know it's a full packed day, so I'm really excited to hear more about the workshops that are coming later downstairs. I'm Teresa Mosqueda. I'm the newest member of Seattle City Council. All right, yeah, some of you have, thanks. <laughs> really, thanks to many of you for making this possible because this is a new role for me to be in. It hasn't even been a year yet. Um, I'm currently the youngest member on Seattle City Council. I'm 38. I'm the only renter. I'm a third generation Chicana. I'm a, a, a Mexican American um, on my dad's side. And I grew up in this region in the Puget Sound area. I've been in Seattle for about 20 years and like many of you have seen many changes. Um, but what I think that we can do together is really find the intersectionality of the struggles that we all fight against to make sure that when change happens, it's change on our terms. When we see development happen, it's development on our terms. When we see the opportunity to live in the city next to our neighbors, next to parks, next to grocery stores, next to childcare centers, next to the schools and our workplaces, that's what economic justice and racial justice and gender justice looks like. And that accomplishes environmental justice. For me, my background is in health policy. I used to work at the well, geez, oh my goodness, how far, how far back do we start? But my background is in public health, working at CMAR Community Health Centers, then the state's Department of Health, and then the Children's Alliance fighting for health care for all children, then the Community Health Network fighting for health care for everyone as we implemented the Affordable Care Act, and then the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. Because what we know creates healthy people is not just a plastic insurance card in your pocket, it is the ability to be able to have a good living wage job, be able to take a sick day when you're sick, to be able to speak up at work and have a union and have a collective voice so that you're not intimidated or harassed, the ability to retire with dignity and to not have to get 78 cents on the dollar because you are a woman or 54 cents because you're a woman of color. The ability to speak up and have a collective voice creates healthier communities. And I've been fighting now in the labor movement and now in this role to make sure that we identify ways to improve people's health. And fighting to make sure that more of us can afford to live in this city next to our workplaces, retire here and stay in our homes that maybe have been generational homes, have a kiddo that can walk to school and be able to bike or walk to your place of employment, that creates health. And when I first started running, when I decided to run for office a year ago or so, um, two years ago now, I just, I, they were like, okay, tell us why you want to run. And so I wrote a six page essay about the deter social determinants of health and it had a pie chart and footnotes and I brought it in and people were like, no voter wants to hear about that. But that's quite literally what we're talking about today. 
and the committee that I now chair, the Housing, Health, Energy, and Workers' Rights Committee, are issues that I intentionally fought for because you can't be healthy if you don't have a place you can call home. You can't be healthy if you don't have the ability to have affordable utilities. You can't be healthy unless you have a good living wage job. And so for me, as we think about health, it also means fighting to make sure that people are able to live here and not be oppressed by the cost of either rent or a mortgage. Live here next to their neighbors in all types of housing options, in duplexes, in triplexes, in apartments, in condos, in co-housing and not just in isolated individual homes. Because when we create more opportunities for people to live in dense neighborhoods next to grocery stores or the grocery stores that we create because folks are living in food deserts, when we create the opportunity for people to live above childcare, the childcare that we create because this is the most expensive city in the country to have infant childcare, when we create opportunities for intergenerational opportunities for people to live next to their elders and their kiddos, we actually improve the health of our community as well. And when we think about density, it's not just wall-to-wall -wall buildings, it's the ability to live in dense neighborhoods next to open public spaces, next to parks and plazas, next to green tree canopies, because that is our new backyard. Those are our new play fields. And we have to, as we create density as well, think about the opportunity to create more green spaces, because again, that's good for the environment. So I see the connections because many of you have helped to eloquently um, uh, carry this message, not from just an environmental perspective, and not from just a build more housing perspective, but truly from the social justice perspective of what it means to create more affordable housing of all types across our city to eradicate the redlining that you showed us and to truly create a welcoming city that we wanna be, because then we will be healthier as well. So, you know, I feel like um, our, in, in everyone's introduction, you know, we did a really excellent job of um, broadening the frame of this conversation. Um, and I think that's important. You know, a lot of times when uh, this conversation is had in the public sphere, uh, the issue of homelessness and the housing crisis is framed purely in uh, terms of housing units and cost per unit, right? Uh, which, you know, is a very narrow and a very, you know, uh, capitalistic framework, right? But I think what everyone up here is really talking about is what does it mean to uh, imagine, work for, and create living communities, right? Um, communities that reflect our values, that reflect who we are as human beings, um, and don't um, sort of uh, undermine you know, who we are as people. And so, um, I don't know, do, did you want to add something to that, Jess, before we jump into the questions? Go for it. Okay, great, great, great. So, um, I think where we'd like to start uh, in sort of dovetailing off of the last comments uh, around density, um, since that is one of the key issues in how we imagine, you know, not only building our cities, but also maintaining the, the natural living environments that surround our cities, the countrysides. Um, let's talk about density. And maybe this is a, 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 a question that, that Katie can feel. Um, how does density make neighborhoods more vibrant? Um, how, do, how does and can density look different in various neighborhoods and cultural contexts? Okay, uh, density. So I mean at the, the simplest level, density is more people per square mile or whatever, right? Um, and what that means, I think, uh, first of all, as an, as an individual, if you're living in a dense area, it probably means that your, your private living space, the place that you call home, um, is smaller. Um, but what that means is that the city or your neighborhood sort of becomes your living room. Um, and I think that's where the potential for vibrancy comes in. People are spending more of their lives out in public space, interacting with each other, um, creating community, participating in community and culture. Of course, density alone um, is not enough to create vibrant communities. You could have you know, just really dense 
huge tall buildings with people crammed in there um, and not have a vibrant community. Um, you also need public space, right? So there's this question of public space versus private space. If you're gonna have vibrant communities, that neighborhood, that city, that's your living room, it needs to be a nice living room. Um, so there need to be places that people can walk, people, people can socialize, people can play. Um, there also needs to be diversity, diversity of incomes. If you just have um, a dense area that's you know, a housing project with just tons of poor people or tons of rich people, um, it's not gonna be vibrant um, in, in the same way. So diversity of incomes, diversity of living spaces. You need um, uh, living spaces that can accommodate families that have children, right? It can't all just be tiny little studios that, that single people can live in. So you need to have, um, families need to be able to live there. Diversity of cultures. Do, do immigrants and communities of color have the ability to start businesses someplace, right? Um, so there's all these questions that, um, in addition to just density, um, are, are necessary to, to have vibrant communities. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of ways um, to, uh, to achieve density. Um, and it, it can look different, right? So in one of the things that I know the, the city is considering now is changing rules around accessory dwelling units. And it's something I think we're probably gonna be talking about later, so I won't go into it. But um, there's ways to add density that don't just entirely change what a neighborhood looks like or feels like. Um, and, you know, density is, is so important to fighting the climate crisis. If you have jobs, grocery stores, schools, churches near where people are living, um, then this becomes very efficient from an energy point of view, right? Um, each household is maintaining that smaller personal living space, uh, but also don't, you don't have to travel as far to, the, to get to the things you need, so you have a much smaller carbon footprint. Uh, I, the only thing I would also echo is when we have people who can live in their communities that they work or study or do their activism or retire and they're not on the bus or commuting for two hours a day, all of those gas emissions are no longer in the environment and car emissions is the single biggest contributor to pollutants in this area. And so in addition to all of the amazing health benefits and um, uh, e efficiencies that Katie just mentioned, we're also creating opportunities for people to get out of their cars and reduce the pollutants that are in the air and um, spend more time enjoying their loved ones and playing in those plazas and uh, going grocery shopping with their families like Katie mentioned. So it's, it's the real tangible um, immediate reduction in greenhouse gas emissions when we don't require folks to drive and be away from their families for hours. So, oh, were you gonna say something? Yeah, oh, I'm just gonna. Yeah. Um, I think that's a beautiful vision that Katie like created for us, right? But that doesn't, that can't be something that happens without thinking about racism and this, and then the chart that we saw earlier about the impacts of historical trauma on communities. Um, and I feel like when I think about like a city that I want to live in, and like not me personally, but like people who look like me, um, I imagine when like when that vision was happening, there was like I found myself really hard to see myself in that vision because it's difficult to see that Seattle making the right choice to do that, right? But I don't care, I'm here, I'm gonna force the city to do what it needs to do to continue to people, for people of color to continue to stay. I personally want to leave, but I wanna create a place where everybody else who looks like me can stay, and that can't happen without thinking about that chart and talking about the history of the United States, but you know, let's just bring it all down to Seattle, the history of Seattle and the way it treated people of color to date. So um, I, I feel like I want to dig a little bit deeper into the issue of density um, because I feel like it, it ripples out into a lot of different areas. Um, so, and this is, I'm, I'm going to direct this to you, Hold on, um, and challenge you to, to kind of go a little deeper. Um, because you talked about living in South Seattle, specifically in Rainier Valley, Rainier Beach area, um, which is one of the most diverse areas in the city, right? And so, you know, I'm really, you know, and I'm speaking from personal experience, um, there's a history of living densely that is inherent to the ways that communities of color live, right? I grew up in a family context where our housing was dense because it was multi-generational. And it was also very fluid, um, which means that people could come in and come out of households um, and accommodations were made um, in a family setting. And so, you know, I'm really curious, you know, 
with um, a large East African population in South Seattle, um, a large Southeast Asian and a large Pacific Islander um, population in South Seattle. How do you imagine people coming from different cultural contexts can really uh, input into this conversation around what dense communities can look like from their specific cultural, social, and familial context? Um, I think density isn't something that's like, it's the word itself to describe how we live is new, but that's not something that's new to us, right? Um, I, like I live with my parents, um, and in our household, there's, except for one sister who lives at UW, because she's going to school, all of us still live with our parents, right? And what my parents used to do when we were younger is that a family friend would come over and it would be like my cousin coming from Arizona with three day notice. And my mom would of course like make room for my family to like, come live with us, right? Um, so I think when we talk about like density and how communities of color have lived together um, and in, also like in one home or like in the same neighborhood of all the same family. Like I think Enye's family is like, um, uh, like I think what kind of we should aspire to when we think about like density to have multiple homes in one place um, and like the way he grew up and all of his family being nearby and like leaving and just be like, okay, I'm gonna go and like go to my other family next door and um, taking people's culture not as like something to detract from the city, but something that adds to the city, right? Um, and I remember uh, a friend of mine was talking about how the city of Seattle was like giving people money to go tell communities of color how to compost. Um, so they have this white person come into their house and be like, this goes into the compost and that goes into the garbage and this and that. And the mom just kind of listened and her daughter was like, wait, we, you do this every single day. Like you do it without even thinking. The food goes here and everything else goes there. Why are you letting all these people like tell you what to do? And she was like, it makes them feel good to think that we don't know what we're doing and somehow kind of tell us what to do, right? And I literally thought to myself and I'm like, you're right, you're here planning for a city and being like, this is how you can fit in. Well, we've already lived how many hundreds of years this way, have been composting. Like, I know, like, the scraps of food goes here. I don't need someone to come into my house and tell me how to live that way, right? Um, and I, and I, I kind of, like, I want to, like, urge people to, like, not think of communities of color, like, especially, like, folks who've, like, immigrated to the United States recently in the last let's say 20 years, um, as people who don't know what they're doing, right? As people who like somehow we need to save and give instruction to and this is what you do and all of that stuff. Just because someone doesn't speak English doesn't mean they're like not smart, right? So like it's just, there's a lot going on here that I think there's a lot that could be learned the way that communities and like, like the East African communities that, which has multiple different countries within that, like Africa is a country, do I have to go back? No, good, good. All right, so like, so, right, and then like folks have come from different places in the world to make a home here, and they already know how to do that, and like learning from that when planning for density is gonna be key, because if folks keep treating density as something that's new and shiny and some white person thought of, it's not gonna work. Can I tack something onto that? Especially on what Hodan just said at the end, um, Density, I mean, the way we've designed our neighborhoods all across the city is actually really new. So the average size of a newly built single family home in the United States and in Seattle, it has increased almost 300% over the last century. And our household sizes are smaller. So the amount of space per person is just bigger than it's ever been in history. We have almost the largest newly built homes in the world. The only country that beats the United States is Australia with larger new home sizes. So we have more space, we're more amply housed than we've ever been. Um, and, and most of our single family neighborhoods are actually less dense than they used to be. They're actually losing people. So when we say density, it's not a new idea, it's actually how people have lived through most of history and we're just talking about returning to some of that history. I'll add a little something to that. I think that's all accurate. And also another frame to look at this is we, when we want to create density, we're actually looking at undoing racist policies that were intentionally put into place to exclude communities from living in certain areas. The concept here just in Seattle alone of urban villages where we see density concentrated in these certain pockets throughout Seattle. Um, very few pockets throughout Seattle have the ability to go higher. And that's a strategy that was put into place just 24 years ago. 
Urban villages are a very new concept that many people decided that they didn't like the um, concept of having a new apartments or new duplexes or new triplexes or new condos going into their neighborhood and they squished all the density into what they called the urban village strategy. So in essence, the apartment that I live in, in Queen Anne, is actually illegal to build now in that neighborhood because we have gone backwards in terms of allowing density. My apartment was built in 1901. We have eight units, we have single, um, single uh, one bedroom apartments in this beautiful old red brick apartment. And down the road for me is apartment, 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 apartment. All of those apartments are in theory illegal to build now. They've been grandfathered in, but they are illegal to build now because that whole area has been considered a single family zone. So the tiny little house that was for sale next to our eight unit apartment, four floors, right? Eight unit apartment. That tiny little house that was for sale two and a half years ago, I walked in after going for a run one day and I walked in, opened the door, they were having an open house and I thought, oh, well this is for sale. It's a really nice area, let me take a look. The realtor looked me up and down and said, this is cash only. And I got the hint. It was not for any of us to purchase. It was for a massive developer or a wealthy person to purchase, and they did. They tore down that little tiny home, and they built a structure that is larger than our eight-unit apartment for a single-family home, because that is what it is zoned for. And that entire structure right now, if you look at it from the outside, if you divided it by what you would think a, a reasonable apartment would be, you could put eight families in there, 10 families in there. And that's what we mean by trying to undo the type of historic zoning that has been put into place, not 100 years ago, not 50 years ago, but just 24 years ago is when these strategies started. So I'm really, um, I'm really excited about one tool that we have in our tool belt, and that is to do what hasn't been done yet on this urban village strategy. And this year, we are going to ask for a racial equity toolkit to be done on this policy that's 24 years old and has never had a racial equity toolkit done. Because when you have 65% of the land in Seattle zone just for single family use, that means you are excluding more families from being able to live in those areas. And when you see the map that you just provided, not only are you excluding people from living in those areas in denser ways that are more inclusive, you're excluding people from parks and grocery stores and childcare facilities and access to transit. So we are gonna do an analysis of these um, policies and actually ask, are we equitably investing in our communities? Yes, we wanna have centers across the city that really will be economic drivers and hopefully women and minority owned businesses in those urban villages. But I also wanna make sure that we're not excluding people from living in various areas of the city because when you see that map, the obvious answer is, it seems we are. You know, I, I want to interject a, uh, another term into this conversation, which is environmental justice, which I know that uh, Got Green is on the forefront of dealing with. And the reason why I feel like it's appropriate, because uh, what you just described, Teresa, um, is a disproportionate burden, okay, of, um, of either carrying, you know, the ills of our society, the collective ills of our society, um, or the collective waste of our society in, in the case of environmental, uh, the issues around environmental justice disproportionately fall on poor and communities of color. Um, a lot of times our poor communities of color, right? Um, most times are poor communities of color. Um, and so, you know, as we're really look, thinking about how, how does this issue of housing actually dovetail with this larger global issue of the environment and climate change, um, you know, and, and thinking about all these things being intertwined, um, that disproportionality, you know, um, there's something underlying it. Some, uh, there are systems underlying it. And so I'm, I'm wondering if anyone on the panel, um, maybe hold on, you know, can elaborate on, you know, the connections between that disproportionality in, um, say for instance, um, an oil refinery you know, being placed, you know, in and around a community of color, or the fact that only people of color can afford, you know, to live in those places, um, and the fact that the places where uh, people of color manage to set up and build homes and communities are the places where people look to uh, first try to resolve the collective ills of our society while other communities remain more or less immune. 
Um, I want to also invite everybody to just kind of like chime in. There's a lot in that question, um, and especially you, Inye, feel free to like come in to this. Um, I think what, let's, I want to start a bit with um, just like all of the circumstances that came together to create climate change. Um, I think before working at Got Green and like obviously like understanding all of this, I just thought, oh wow, like it's, here it is, we didn't do nothing, right? Uh, but like even though it was the back of my mind, I was like, maybe we should investigate that a bit more. Um, so when we think about the United States and the way and the, how we came about this country, right? We start with like, like the murder and the complete annihilation, almost complete annihilation of um, native peoples, right? Of culture, of people, and like the horrendous um, activities that had to happen, that did happen, for us to be in this place where we are today, right? And then following that, the enslavement of black people and African people, right? Like the purpose, purpose, purposeful stealing of people from one side of the world to bring only for work, right? To be used as properties, right? Um, and I, I just say all this so we have like some sort of like lay out in our brains about how we came to be where we are today, like colonialism, capitalism, white supremacy, all those things coming together to ensure that white people have privilege for generations on, to have the home that your parents passed down and their parents passed down that's in like the nicely cushy part of North Seattle, um, that has the cleanest air in the city, that has um, the best schools in the city, that has the most walkable, if you know, houses are a little bit far, so maybe you don't really walk as much, you drive everywhere, but still, the air there welcomes you to do that, right? All of that was like in your good fortune, but also at the backs and the disproportionate impacts of other people's misfortune, right? Um, so uh, I did, I, when I started at Got Green, my fifth day at work, I, I went to a presentation um, by Jackie uh, Peterson Patterson, who is the NAACP person on climate, um, on climate change. And she was giving this whole presentation, and I was like just learning. I'm lear literally writing down every other word. And she said across the country, um, in places that have um, like coal plants, oil refineries, all the things that are like wrong, right? Like why do we burn, why do we burn fossil fuels? You know, everything is wrong and three people into this room, but other people, maybe they think that's okay. Um, the 70% of African Americans live near those coal plants. And I just like put my pen down and I let that like, like let that, like let those statistics, like I know we're like kind of like, oh, numbers, and you just kind of like disengage, but let it affect you, right? Like 70%, right? What, like that's just like a literal like direct impact of how black people and especially people who are descendants of African slaves are treated in the United States, right? And that might not be true for me as a recently arrived immigrant, uh, right? Like the way race works is that the way people look at you and they see that, but there's also ethnicity and there's a whole bunch of things. So there are, we're all black people, but within that, we're not a monolith, there's like a bunch of other things. I'm giving you a history of basically everything. So like I'm going off on a lot of different, so y'all stop me. It's all really connected, but you have to know all of these different things so you understand the point that I'm trying to make, right? So when I, when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, this is like, and I talked to her afterwards, and of course, people don't think, I, I, actually, you know what, I'm gonna like let it not do that. People who are running those um, oil refineries or whatever, not the people who are working in them, because those people, the circumstances are there that they have to work there to feed their families, but the corporations that own them, they know what they're doing. Like they're not just like, they purposely did not put the, the, the oil refinery on the other side where they live and having their kids have asthma and have their kids have cancer and have their kids drink water that's not, that's coming from pipes that have been infected for generations and watching all of the officials just be like, oh yeah, like black people have been showering in this, black kids have been drinking this and not doing anything about it. Like that's all purposeful and it's to serve capitalism, right? Um, and that's when the environmental justice comes in, right? Because environmentalism is like, for white people, I'm just gonna be real. But environmental justice, when we take into account the racist history of this country and the way that white supremacy has impacted communities of color, to then explain what's happening in the environment, right? So it's all connected, but it's a, way, it's a place that we created to us to be seen, right? So it was like people of color, black people in particular, who 
we're talking about these connections long before it was popular and like people like me were getting educated in it. Um, and I kind of want to leave it there because I just talked a lot, but I also want to give you and you and everyone else to kind of like chime in a little, add a little bit to that. And I'm looking at you and Ye. Well, I, I'm, I'm probably gonna, I'm probably gonna decline to, to speak too much on this panel. Um, I think there are probably a couple of interesting things to, to maybe kind of tie that up and then you know, uh, bring some of the other panelists into the conversation. But uh, Teresa, I'm, I'm just wondering, as a council person, can you speak to the way that um, that uh, political power, you know, as it's leveraged neighborhood by neighborhood, has an influence on how policies are crafted um, that allow this kind of disproportionality to happen? Ooh, all right. So let's talk about political power first. Um, we spend a lot of time asking people to um, run for office, vote, uh, and get engaged in the political system. But I think in the last five, 10 years, we've seen the reality when people don't have someone who looks like them, don't have someone who speaks their language, does, doesn't have someone who comes from their neighborhood run for office. A lot of our younger communities, communities of color, stay disengaged. What I'm hoping um, that we can export from Seattle is what we see now on city council, majority people of color, super majority women, and more people I think seeing that they now have the opportunity to have their voice heard. Also, as a renter, I wanna make sure that the 52 to 54% of us, we're the majority, that we have our voices heard on, on council. And historically, when you have individuals who are serving in either the legislature, because they only make around $38,000 a year, which is not a living wage, which you can't raise a family on, and that's why we see older, whiter, richer folks. It was a headline, I didn't say it, from the Seattle Times, 2014, that Washington State politics, politicians are older, whiter, richer than the other Washington. We have got to do a better job of both recruiting folks to get into office, making sure that they're living wages, making sure that people are held accountable, and that our voices are truly centered when policy decisions are being made. And now, I'm a renter, and I know many, how many of you are renters? See, we're the majority, majority of Seattle is renters. How many of you would like to be able to potentially have your own place one day that you can call your own, a place that you can own? The reason that we're raising our hands is because we don't have a solid retirement system in this country. And owning is very likely the only way to get out of generational poverty for many families and also the ability to create equity in your pocketbook, but the equity that I'm talking about as well for communities of color that we've been talking about, we've been historically left out. In the recession, since the recession, um, the number of community of color owned homes have declined. And I believe the statistic was the amount of um, wealth that was earned since the Jim Crow era had been wiped out in terms of um, actual wealth that communities of color owned post recession because we are the ones who suffered the most. And now, when I think about uh, what that means for trying to um, make sure that our voices are heard, is making sure that communities who've been historically not included in the conversation actually are the first ones invited to the table. That means the individuals who haven't been asked their opinions are reached out to and not asked to come to a meeting, but the politicians go into those neighborhoods and ask folks directly, what do you want to see? So that policy decisions can truly be rooted in what communities are asking for. That's what I'm hoping that we see more of when we see more representative democracies, uh, uh, individuals elected to have a true representative democracy. So. I'm really interested in how we create first-time home ownership options, how we create more duplexes and triplexes and condos and apartments that are affordable. I'm interested in, when we say the word development, not having that equal in people's mind displacement. And I'm interested in what it means from communities of color especially and from low-income wor workers and from um, individuals who've been left out of the table, including women, to have a seat at the table to talk about what density means, what development means, what it means to have home ownership options and what it means to have affordable opportunities to live in this city. And so when we created, for example, the last version of our land disposition policy, which by the way, a lot of the times our terminology around housing excludes people from coming to the table, right? So land disposition means, are we gonna sell this piece of property that the city owns to the highest bidder? Or should we hold it in the public's hand and use it for the public's good and build public housing and affordable housing and parks and play centers? Because I think it's the latter. 
we are trying to break down we're trying to break down the terminologies because land disposition and adu dadu and um, AMI and floor area ratio and all these terms that we often use in the housing world, these are all terms I had to learn. But unless we create a table and break down those walls and stop using terminologies that exclude people because sometimes they've intentionally excluded people in the past, then we're gonna perpetuate the same system. So what we're trying to do, um, I think, is build a new system of what it looks like to be accountable. There is um, a really exciting piece of policy that passed that, that is called the land disposition policy, but basically it was created by a somewhat large coalition of folks that came together, uh, Got Green, 350, um, Sightline, a number of you all were part of that conversation about what it looks like, but the ultimate outcome was, don't sell public land to the highest uh, bidder. <laughs> Prioritize that land for affordable housing and put underneath it public good services like childcare and grocery stores and public spaces and green places and folks for people to play and pea patches and small opportunities for women and minorities to create their own businesses. And that's what the building model should look like. And if the city decides that it no longer can keep that parcel of land doesn't want to build that housing in partnership with communities and wants to put it out there to bid, then make it available all the way down to zero cost, especially for communities who've been left out of the conversation so that communities of color and low-income workers can actually have site control and build the housing that we so desperately need. That's what I think it looks like to actually have policies rooted in the communities that are calling for change, calling for development done right, and calling for our communities not to be displaced but at the table. And so that's what I'm hoping that we will continue to do as we think about what it means to reform, um, what development means in this city, create the tables, hold ourselves accountable to make sure that those policies actually work. Um, because changing the policy on paper um, has to equal changes in community and that'll be the next step. Uh, just to add a couple of things to that, I think um, everything that Teresa said about representation, um, spot on. Um, but also I think that you know, if you have um, neighborhoods where people own their houses, they've been there for a long time, there's a kind of political power, especially if you're wealthy, you, know, you have the time, you have the leisure, and you feel like this is your space and you want to protect it. And so um, you know, uh, single family neighborhoods uh, with, with constant ownership over the generations tend to be really politically engaged and very vocal and they've had time to sort of build up that um, and also those connections right they know their neighbors they they participate in their you know community council or whatever and so there's um, a really a disproportionate voice um, for, for a lot of neighborhoods if you're if you're a renter if you're new to Seattle if you're you have to move every year because your rent goes up or or whatever you just and if you're just always hustling for your day-to-day -day needs you have a lot less leisure to participate in politics and, and really figure out what your interests are um, and, and fight for them. Um, I also think um, you know, it's really important to be creating opportunities for affordable home ownership. I think, for instance, the work that Homestead Community Land Trust does is really um, interesting, important. Um, but also, I, I think more fundamentally, we need to be questioning the model of needing to become a homeowner um, in order to have a dignified life, right? And, um, I mean, me for instance, I never expect to own a home and I don't particularly want to. Um, and, but in order for that to be feasible, um, there needs to be, you, we need to have health care, we need to have retirement security, we need to have all of these, you know, education, all of these things need to be social goods that are guaranteed for everyone. You shouldn't need to have generational wealth or, or individual wealth that you've built up in order to, um, uh, to count on those things. Yeah. I think uh, we should even go even like further than that, and especially in talking and like confronting capitalism head on, which sounds very like painful, uh, but also like, this idea that to own, like you're buying a home so you can like save money so that your kids and generations can have money, like tying homes in the place that you live and the place that you feel secure to like money, like and commodifying homes. Like I want us to like try to find, uh, try to uh, imagine a world where that's not the case and maybe in that world capitalism doesn't exist. Uh, but also like we give people opportunity to like belong in a world that they don't want to own a home, but also people to have homes and not think about them as a way of like cultivating wealth. 
Um, and I think it would go a long way in, in solving a lot of our problems. So I, I just wanted to make sure that we brought Margaret in on this point. Well, just because uh, in our lead up to this panel, um, uh, you specifically, you know, um, challenged the notion of ownership as being, you know, the thing that we should rest, you know, our ideals on. And I, so I wanted to make sure that, you know, you, you specifically forwarded the idea that are there other options, are there other ways of thinking about this? And so I wonder if you can speak to yeah. your, your ideas around that. And if I could tack on to that, um, you know, other options, other creative solutions that both address the housing crisis and get our emissions down. Yes, I would love to talk about that. First, I'm gonna jump on a couple of things that have been said here. Um, there's a pretty interesting history in, our, in the city of Seattle of who is able to wield political power over our housing policies. And you see this, Teresa's apartment is the perfect example of this. So Teresa's apartment is in the north half of the city, which is generally the wealthier half, also corresponds well with the, with the redlining map, an area that received investment in the past. Those areas, like the whole city, used to permit a big diversity of housing types, and yet those neighborhood groups have had the political power to very specifically, very intentionally advocate for down zoning. So where we used to permit an apartment or a duplex, now we only permit single family zones. So neighborhoods, like if you look at the history of our zoning maps, um, neighborhoods like Wallingford and Laurelhurst and Woodland Park, have very intentionally down zoned since then. Meanwhile, in South Seattle, you see the opposite trend. That, those are the areas that have been asked to take on more housing types. They've gone the other way. They're, they've up zoned um, over the last century. That is because who holds power in the city? Who's able to hire a lawyer or organize or work for that? So anyway, it's an interesting way that who holds power in the city is really written even into our zoning codes. Um, and you can see that in the history of the city. So that's one thing. But then if we talk about home ownership, um, I love what you all are saying up here that we need to have other ways of making people secure besides just owning a home. But one thing I'm thinking a lot about is um, I think home ownership is one of the most important ways we can stabilize communities. We can give people some power over their lives to choose to stay in a place. Um, but what can we do to support low-income homeowners in Seattle? That's a really big question that we need to be asking. And so one thing I'm playing with in my mind a lot these days is the idea of an accessory dwelling unit as a means of supplementing income for a low-income household. Or say a senior household living on a fixed income that wants to live in place, age in place. A uh, low-income household, household of color. There are creative ways to support people to attain home ownership and maintain it. Um, so one of those could be accessory dwelling units, which bring in some additional rental income, and there's other solutions, but I just wanted to get that conversation started. Can I just add a little thing? I just want to thank you guys for bringing that up because um, it's something that I think we should talk a lot more about, the type of securities that we need to make sure that families are economically stable, and we do think about home ownership as one way, and how do we get more people the opportunity to have that stability? Um, but I think uh, Katie and Hodon really hit on a critical point. In many of the countries and cities that we see in incredibly dense um, opportunities to live in cities and work there and study there and play there, they have affordable childcare and guaranteed health care and guaranteed retirement security. And I think that uh, that goes back to what we talked about earlier. Housing is one element of what we need in order to be secure, but we need a guaranteed access to housing because housing is a human right, just like health care should be and child care should be and the ability to have a good living wage job. So as we fight for these things, I think it's incredibly important to continue to lift up our fight for universal health care, universal child care, universal retirement security because these are all issues that we don't have, just like we don't have access to housing as a right here in this country. And that is part of the capitalism and um, imperialist model that we all have all inherited and we continue to fight every day, but I think it's a critically important element. I was just in Berlin and Mike Eliasson is out there and he's gonna be downstairs later doing a workshop. I hope you get a chance to hear from him. He connected me with one of the thought leaders in Berlin who's working on density models there. And I joined them at their co-housing um, where each person 
pays in to live together and shares a living room and a kitchen and um, gardens and things like that. And I told him that we had over half of our population here in Seattle as renters. And he said, well, half, he goes, half that, we have 80% of the population in Berlin who's renters. And he's like, but we also have retirement security and guaranteed childcare and guaranteed healthcare and some of the highest unionization rates in the entire um, EU. So I think all of these issues are connected and really appreciate you guys broadening our thoughts about what it actually means to be economically stable. Appreciate that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> these are really big and complicated issues. And we've been, when we've been speaking, you know, we've been doing a deep dive into, you know, the complexities of, you know, how housing looks in our communities, in our cities. Um, so I'm just going to complicate the conversation a little bit more. Um, and, and, and ask, you know, each of you in your own way to connect these really complicated issues to issues of climate instability and climate vulnerability. I mean, where do these really big global issues really dovetail in ways that you know, we can kind of grasp in our local communities. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, on panels, usually I'm the person sitting next to the facilitator and then all the questions come to me first and I'm like, I wish I had thought about that when I was saying this. Um, okay, so we, um, we got green, uh, work in the interesting and definitely more needed more of intersections of climate and like housing, right? Um, and for a really long time, people were like, but why? Like, what is this thing? Um, so when we, th we work on issues, oh, well, I, in my committee um, capacity, work on um, issues of displacement, right? Um, we've all mentioned how the city's changing. We've all mentioned, like, who, uh, is changing it and who is doesn't have the opportunity to change it. Um, so we work on, um, so I'm just gonna start with my current campaign right now. Uh, so we have a current campaign called Don't Displace Dove. Um, and Dove, uh, um, Esther, little Dove John, is like an amazing community organizer, activist, person that shaped the city and probably shaped the way we think about like war and peace and environment and all of that. And um, ha is just reached out to Guy Green a couple years ago and was like, hey, my building's being torn down and they're building um, small efficiency dwelling units and I don't wanna just leave quietly and like continue to like feel erased from the city. I wanna be the poster elder for this problem. Like, what can we do? Um, and we're like, yeah, let's dive right in, right? So we like made sure, we gave, the, the developer, Bill Durbin, um, a piece of our mind. Um, first, we were like, hey, this is a problem, and this, this is a citywide problem. We can be working together to create a solution that doesn't uh, erase people of color from the city. We got no answer. Cool, we're a community organizer, so we use the tools to, that are at our uh, disposal to make sure that his life was a bit difficult for a while, right? We did actions at his place, but the idea is to like call attention to like predatory development like that one, right? Um, we, looked at the, we looked at the building schematics and all of that, and there was no way for someone who was elder, who um, needs an elevator, who needs like a, um, um, develop, um, disability accessibility to like be in this building. So it was actually like unsafe for her to like even live there if she had the opportunity, right? Um, so we started talking about um, like how do we create a policy, like something big, right, that encompasses the entire city that focus on these issues and bring and highlights the people who are being erased, right? So you're probably thinking like, what's the connection between communities of color who are uh, who are being erased from the city and like the climate change, like the way we think of climate and like the carbon emissions and pollution. Um, the way we think about them is that, right, so when only people, only communities who are rooted in place, who've got the support of their neighbors, of their family, of the places where they pray, play, and uh, are connected to and work, um, are, are the folks who will survive climate change, whatever form it takes, or whatever forms it takes. Um, right, so when, when I live in a neighborhood, right, and I know my neighbors, and my job is five minutes from my house, um, I'm one of the lucky people who get to live and work in the same area, right? Uh, but I am displaced to, like, Covington, right? But just because I live in Covington now doesn't mean my job, my family, my friends, the people that I want to see every day don't still live here. 
So I'm driving two hours in the traffic that's I-5 and I-90 and everywhere else um, into the city and participating in the carbon emissions, right? We talked about people who are driving being the highest uh, polluters, right? So I'm both the victim of climate change and the perpetrator of climate change and putting people in places where they're having to participate in the things that are ruining the planet in order for themselves to survive, themselves to survive, right? So we wanna create a world where people, people of color, continue to live in Seattle, have a home that's healthy, right? Um, when we talk about folks who are renting, some people, let's just be out there, people are slumlords. They're not making sure that the, the spaces that I'm renting and people are like what, paying like 1,800 or more and still living in like places that has like moss and all these other disgusting things that make it hard for you to breathe healthy, right? To have houses that are affordable but also healthy in, in locations that are like, access, like have access to like um, public transit, to libraries, to places that like enrich our, our, our souls and our communities, um, but also to create, to create a sense of belonging, right? Um, and that's the kind of world that we envision and that's how we, talking about housing as a, as a climate like mitigation strategy, like climate like survival tactics, right? But also creating ways for us to thrive. And that's how those two things are, are connected for us um, and should be connected because climate change is, uh, the way I think about it when people ask me what I do for a living, like I organize under the umbrella of climate change because it touches everything else, right? It touches the way this, this city and this country prepares for hotter winters, a lot of more people in in cities and less in, uh, in like, you know, like the countryside or uh, people, more immigration to the United States because we're participating in ruining the global south, right? There are part, when people are talking about like, we can survive one and a half degrees of warming, we in Seattle might be able to do that, but what about people who farm in like middle of Africa and parts of uh, Central America, right? Those places become unfarmable and too hot to live at like a lower degree than we are tolerating, right? So then we were like, we don't want people coming here. We want to make sure we secure our futures. Well, you should have been thinking about that before you, you know, colonized everybody and brought me here from, you know, wherever I came from, right? Or wherever everybody else came from. Um, so it's climate change is much bigger than what mainstream environmentalists talk about, right? Um, and when I always introduce my organization, I always say POC-led, people of color-led, environmental justice organization, because we center the people who are most impacted, and those are people who are people of color, who are immigrant and refugees, people who are low income, um, people who continue to, like, and I, I wanna create like a really like harsh picture in your mind, because when, when I talk about displacement, I don't just talk about people like, moving, I say the forced and violent removal of people of color, because you have to think about it in those terms for me to pick, to draw that image in your head, so the next time you're talking to somebody about it, you t also use those same words, because it's, it's that damaging to people to lose where they're from in their community and everything else, and having to drive from all these far places, and then being, people of color don't have electric cars. Yo, I can't afford to live here, I don't have money for $40,000 car. So I'm wondering, Katie, can you just, from someone that works directly around transit issues, can you make a connection from your point yeah, of view? Yeah, I'll say something about public transit. So um, here in Seattle and regionally, we've been investing a lot in our public transit system, which is great. Um, and I think as Teresa said before, um, transportation is the number one uh, contributor to our carbon emissions um, here in Washington State. And um, you know what makes public transit efficient? density. Um, so we're constantly coming up against this problem in the work that I do. So like right now, we're trying to get King County to move forward with a more comprehensive low income fare, recognizing that the Orca Lift program, while great, is still not affordable for uh, many, many people who have very low or no income. Um, so we're trying to push them toward a you know, sliding scale low income fare, you know, something like that. Um, and they want to do it, but there's this problem, which is revenue. Um, and so they're saying, well, you know, we can do this, but then maybe we have to raise fares on everyone else. Um, now, there's a couple of things that can get us out of that bind. 
One is progressive taxation, which you know, we're also working on. Um, but the other one is density, right? If we can create a really dense city where lots and lots of people are living here, taking public transit as opposed to driving, um, that means that the fare box recovery rate or the, you know, the revenue that the public transit system is getting from fares um, goes up just because so many people are using the system. It's very efficient. Um, and so just from, from that point of view, I mean, that's a very small piece in one, one bigger puzzle, but um, it, uh, that, that's sort of one example of how the uh, you know, housing policy and, and density relate to, to transit and making our public transit system um, financially sustainable and make it possible for us to also make it affordable and accessible for everyone. Great. Um, so uh, we're going uh, to kind of move into the final uh, leg of, of this conversation. Um, so I just wanted to say to the ushers, the ushers in the room, um, this would be a time to start distributing comic cards to the audience. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, please be thinking about your questions now. Uh, someone will be coming around to uh, give you a comment card uh, so that when we get into the Q&A, uh, we can kind of move through it in the time that we have. Okay. Uh, did you want to sort of tackle our last question? Sure. Um, before I ask this kind of closing question for the moderated panel part, I just want to say thank you for the depth and breadth of this discussion. It's been fascinating and energizing, and I'm so excited to move into the breakouts. Um, so I invite each panelist to offer some closing thoughts on the following. As we think about our shared responsibility to tackle both the housing crises and the climate crises in this place, how do we bring wealthier white neighborhoods into the conversation and part of making our city more livable? I can start. I can start. I'll give a start. I think understanding history is really important. This whole conversation is just rooted in history. And if you don't have a sense of that, it doesn't make sense. So, I mean, I don't know. We've talked about so many different angles on that history from a global history to very local. Um, but just from the local perspective, I'm just going to talk about the little teensy work I do at Sightline. I look at these historic zoning maps and I say, look who has taken on the burden in this city, and look who has systematically avoided it. And it is our wealthier, predominantly whiter neighborhoods. And so I think one small answer to that question is telling that story of who has benefited, um, who has been able to fight and have control over their life and who hasn't, um, and, and using that to frame up the conversation. This is a hard question because, I, <laughs> um, I mean, in general, my sort of outlook on how we're going to change things is by organizing, bringing, bringing people together and bringing our collective power uh, to bear. Um, but I don't generally think that organizing wealthy white neighborhoods <laughs> is, is a big part of that work. Um, but, I mean, those conversations are useful to have. Uh, yeah. Do you want to clarify the question? I should clarify the question. Um, <laughs> I guess where that question is coming from is the recognition that like there's already so much power, so much work, and so much like solution making coming out of communities who are most impacted by the housing crisis and the climate crisis. Like Hodan, you talked about how you know density is like a new word for a thing that's been happening for a while, right? We've heard a number of folks talk about the history of housing in Seattle um, and the ways in which. Um, communities have been like adapting and still thriving in response to like the housing pressures put on them. And we've seen those pressures coming pretty consistently from the wealthier, wider neighborhoods up north. So in asking us to, to kind of close on that question, I want to wrap recognizing the, the solution making and the power and like life thriving that's coming out of communities most impacted and recognizing that until older, wider, wealthier, neighbors recognize their role in the historical uh, processes that got us to this moment, um, we're having two different conversations about housing, right? That's helpful, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that there is a lot of useful um, conversations and education and, and organizing that can happen because what you have now is, I mean, even, even if, you know, wealthier single-family neighborhood, whiter neighborhoods tend to be more, like, 
vocal and politically engaged in a certain way, it, there's still, it's still only a minority of people in those neighborhoods that's engaged, right? So there are a lot of people, and I think there are a lot of people who would be very sympathetic to all of the things that we've been talking about here today that are just not particularly tuned in. They're just sort of minding their own business, right? So I think that um, all of us really have a, an obligation, especially those of us who are white and perhaps wealthier and perhaps live in those neighborhoods, um, to do, do that work and go out and talk to our neighbors and try to get people politically engaged. You're not going to convince people who are just like totally on the other side, but um, there's a lot of people out there who just aren't paying attention, um, and I think that we can get them engaged. Um, this is an interesting question, and one that I think about often, but don't do much about, because <laughs> um, in organizing, my job is to organize the people most impacted, because a, I work at Got Green, and that's who we center. But also, as a person who is most impacted, it's hard for me to like have this conversation from someone who like, like say we like meet up in city council, and I'm gonna testify, and this person from North Seattle who's rich and white wants to testify too. Like those are the only places where we might run into each other. A, because I live and work in South Seattle, so I don't really have a lot of opportunities to go to North Seattle. Uh, nor do I want to. I mean, I went to UW, but that's as far north as I usually go. Um, and another thing is, is like all of the underlining issues of all of this is like racism, right? And I don't particularly relish having a conversation and like bringing on like white, older, richer white people to talk about racism because in their minds, maybe it's over. Maybe it's just, or maybe I'm being self-centered and self-serving by talking to them about this. So that, of course I am. I wanna, I wanna continue to live in Seattle. I wanna continue to thrive in a place that um, I've called home for a really long time. But also, I want us all to come along and understand that racism is not a problem for people of color to solve. It is a problem for white people to solve because that is who is benefiting from this, right? And we can talk about solidarity and allyship all day long. I can literally sit here and tell you all about these things, but we're past that. At this point, I would like to use a term that I heard from um, Alicia Garza, who's one of the Black, who's the Black Lives Matter activists and co-founders, um, says, we need co-conspirators. We need people who have skin in the game, things to lose in order for us to make any changes that will be like big enough to impact what's happening in the world, right? And I'm talking about climate change at this point, right? We need to, those people who are living in the northern, um, healthier, cooler part of the city to also feel the impacts of what it's like to live in um, white center, right? And die on average 10 years earlier than the people who are living in North Seattle. People need to take this personally. People need to let other people's um, other people's lives and things that are impacting them personally. And I'm using all these words that my acting teacher is using in class. Take things personally. Things that don't impact you, but it's not, it's not about you. It's not about you surviving and you and your kids and your grandkids having houses for hundreds of years to come. Because we don't have time. There are not 100 years left on this planet, maybe even less. And it's really scary and really hard to think about. And honestly, I have nightmares about it, like every other, every other, maybe every other month. But take it personally. You organize the communities that you're a part of, so I don't have to, right? And just remember, if you remember nothing else from this conversation, remember that climate change will impact everybody at some point. Like, this is not something you can hide from. Two. Racism is not a problem for people of color to solve, and racism impacts everything. And three, take everything personally. Really, get involved. I need co-conspirators. Get your skin in the game. Get, start having, start empathy, not sympathy. Just, I'm saying a lot of words to you. Just remember these, because it will make sense one day. So one, one thing that I think we can take away from this conversation and many of the conversations you've all already been starting through your community organizations and um, conversations with neighbors is that it is a both and discussion. We can fight for environmental justice and that doesn't mean fighting new development. We can fight to make sure that folks can live in our city and that doesn't mean that we're anti-climate um, justice. When we actually create opportunities for us to couple environmental justice and housing justice issues together, I think we accomplish multiple goals. And that is one way I'm hoping that we can bring more people into this conversation. I think that there's a lot of um, 
mistrust for very good reasons, um, especially from communities of color who've historically been kept out of the conversation, quite literally redlined out of having the ability to own, a, uh, to, to have an affordable place uh, to call home. People who have been told everything's gonna be fine and then a freeway is driven through their community. Everything's gonna be fine and then their small business closes because of construction that happens. Everything's fine and then they get displaced when new development comes in. People who've been left out of the conversation are very much distrustful because that is the lived experience. So we have to recognize that we have to change the tables and actually change the dialogue and change the policies to reflect the lived experience of people who have been left out and pushed out. I also think that there is a conversation to be had about reframing what it means to have development in areas that have historically pushed it out of their communities. So we did talk about the North End a little bit. I want to acknowledge as well, there are a number of communities of color, especially immigrant communities who are living in the far North area of Seattle. Some of the highest rates of um, children who are on free and reduced lunch. And so this issue of affordable housing really is an issue that affects our entire city but the reality is it's an issue that's affecting our entire country and is heavily focused on the West Coast right now. This is a West Coast crisis of housing and homelessness, and I think we need to look for opportunities to bring more people into this conversation so that we're not constantly not seeing the intersectionality, not seeing the commonality, but finding that path forward. There's a lot of, I think, opportunity for us to change our language. When we talk about... Um, when we talk about development, meaning that people are taking on a higher burden, well, if we were at the table in our own communities to talk about what it looks like to create that development, that development doesn't have to equal burden or displacement if our own folks are having the right to come back and live in those communities. If the folks who could have been displaced actually have an affordable place to call home for the rest of their lives, if they now can go downstairs and put their child into childcare and take the bus or the light rail and get to work in a fast way, when we think about what development means, it doesn't mean what we're currently seeing right now. And the reason that it doesn't equal the type of development that communities have been experiencing is because we have constantly faced lawsuits and constantly faced appeals. And we have to get past these appeals and lawsuits and legal tactics that are being used because the reason that people are fearful of development coming into their neighborhood is because it hasn't been regulated, it hasn't been done right, and it hasn't included our community voice yet. So once we get past these legal hurdles, the first priority is making sure that those who've been left out of the conversation at risk of displacement and our lowest income communities have a place at the table so that we can call it home, we can do development through our own eyes, and that we can re-shift um, re the balance of power so that we now have the purse strings, we have the land that's publicly owned, we have housing that is in the public's trust, and we have a generation that can grow up without having to be fearful of getting pushed out of the city. I think that's how we help include more people in this conversation. So I appreciate that the questions coming in are really action-oriented, like taking what we've heard today and saying, okay, now what? what do we do? Um, so I'd like to start with one that connects to, to what you were just speaking about, Teresa, and maybe dives in a little bit. Um, the question is, how can an organization that has affordable living apartment plan access the funding to complete the projects? And maybe to open that up more broadly, I'd ask, how can we like actually think about community-controlled development? Like, how does that get started? What do we have to do to make that happen? You want to start off on that idea? Yeah. Right. Um, Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Are, you got the fun for the EDI? Do you want to talk about my EDI? Oh, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> Shared ownership up here. Um, so one opportunity that we have right here in Seattle is to make sure that um, the community is asked first, uh, what, what would you like to see built versus selling land at the highest price? So let's back up a second here. Um, we have an opportunity, let's see, what's a good example? When we have a parcel of land that the city uh, of Seattle owns, let's say it's City Light owned, and the City Light decides that they no longer need it, the current practice was, prior to last month, to sell it at the highest uh, rate because we kept hearing this is gonna help us plug holes in the budget, which is so short-sighted if you think about how limited the land is in Seattle. We are surrounded by lakes and the Puget Sound. There is very little place for people to actually live if you think about a parcel of land only allowing for one unit or one family to live on. But if that parcel of land were to be able to 
be built up and create the density that we need, it can house a lot more people and we can create the public spaces and the parks and the green space that our community so desperately needs. We have now changed the practice and we have, as I told you before, put past the land disposition policy. But ways that we can make sure that our community has the first shot at getting back into those homes or having the opportunity to stay in Seattle and not get pushed out or being able to have economic security by having a guaranteed affordable housing unit is by actually giving over the keys to that new housing to the communities that work directly with those organizations. So let's just say Got Green wanted to um, work on, out of the first floor of a, a small business on the first floor and actually have some level of management over the, who, uh, over, over the housing above it. When we have site control, when we have the opportunity to make sure that our communities are coming first in the door, it lo really looks like community preference. And that's one way that we can help undo the, his, the, the, the racist and wrong um, initiative that Tim Iman passed that prevents us from actually being able to have truly um, pol policies that are truly informed by affirmative action policies that undo historic racism. So I'm very interested in additional site control when the city no longer needs a parcel of property. How do we do long-term mass releasing with organizations that will then be able to have site control and think, and think about community preference first? What was the specific question? That the specific question was about funding. So funding oh. also happens in the context of all the things that you just talked about. Um, but this person wrote, I dropped the card, um, you know, when, it, when an organization has a plan to do like, you know, affordable apartment housing, how do they get it funded? Um, and given your experience at the county recently, I'm wondering if you could talk about how um, that funding process is one that involves good community organizing as well. Sure, um, yeah, and I'm not an expert in all of the various funding streams that are or can be used for <laughs> affordable housing. I mean, I will say one thing about, so the city um, fairly recently um, started the Equitable Development Initiative um, Fund, and that was due to work by Puget Sound Sage, I think Got Green and, and others as well. Um, and that fund is specifically for not just housing, but um, development that can include housing, but also businesses, community centers, et cetera, um, that is community owned and or controlled. Um, and uh, I believe that what funding from the short-term rental tax, um, some of that is going into that fund. Um, and then there is, I, I assume, a long waiting list of projects that are hoping to get some of that money and um, probably not enough money. And that's a general story with funding for affordable housing. Definitely that, not enough money. Yeah, definitely not enough money. And, and this is something that we've also, you know, some of us um, uh, in this room have been uh, doing some work around the Mercer mega block uh, parcel and uh, Teresa has been um, great on that. And uh, you know, this is this big city owned parcel in South Lake Union um, and the city is in the middle of probably selling off or leasing um, all or most of that land. Um, and it's really challenging because there's just not, like there's all these affordable housing developers that have plots ready to go, projects ready to go, and the funding isn't there. So if we were to keep that land in public ownership, which is what I would prefer to do, we don't have you know, tons of money sitting around to suddenly build um, a big affordable housing development there. If the city sells it or leases it, then they can use that money and build affordable housing elsewhere. So these are the kind of trade-offs that we shouldn't have to make, but we are in the position of, of making right now because we don't have uh, that money. And um, I think I'm gonna be doing a workshop shortly on finding funding for affordable housing. So um, that, that's a big, a big challenge. So, uh sort of connecting to that. Uh, another part of the affordable housing mix are how do you integrate single family homes plots into you know those options and so this person uh, is asking about the politics of the DADU which is the accessory dwelling unit ordinance which I'm not sure if this person is speaking specifically to MHA um, possibly, you know, as a zoning ordinance uh, that's gonna be coming up for council to vote on. Um, but what are the politics of it? Uh, and what does the opposition look like? And uh, where do, so this was directed towards the council member, but I'm gonna field it to everyone, because um, I'm just kind of curious about how people feel about how this is gonna play out. 
All right, uh, what does the opposition look like? So strangely enough, the folks that have initiated the opposition to the attached dwelling units or the detached dwelling units, um, which would be uh, small, livable, either apartments, um, one and two bedrooms for families, the ability for people to have um, elders, you know, maybe their, their parents stay in the back and or rent it out to a family who needs affordable housing in the city. A great way to do sort of a infill density option. It's not the most dense, but it's an infill kind of light touch density option. The folks who are opposing it the most come from an area that used to have attached and detached dwelling units, who used to have apartments like mine, who used to have triplexes and duplexes because they're coming right out of my neighborhood. And um, it's folks who used to have the ability to have greater density who've been pushed over time to have um, the neighborhood, especially in Queen Anne, uh, look more just like single family units. So it's really interesting. It's coming from the same neighborhoods that would look like the neighborhoods that they're coming from, which if you walk around my neighborhood, you do see two and three bedrooms. You see actually some beautiful old homes, right? Think Queen Anne, beautiful old homes with three, four, sometimes five or six entrances because they're actually apartments or triplexes or duplexes. They're apartments like mine, beautiful old brick buildings. That's the neighborhood that is saying, we don't want that. But yet they're living in a neighborhood that's beautiful and recognized for that type of housing and density. So that's where it's coming from. Um, I can tell you that uh, we are hopeful that we can get past this because it would be one small component to a much larger puzzle that we need to create the actual density. Ironically though, that's, that's where it's coming from if I understand correctly. Okay. All right, so, um, so we, we actually, it's, the comment card is actually interesting. It's good to see that uh, a lot of the questions are very similar which means that there's definitely some things that are resonating throughout the audience. Um, we're limited on time, so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the last three cards, I'm gonna read through all three cards because I'd like for everyone at least to have their question resonate throughout the room, um, and then we'll kind of see if there are any last comments, okay? Uh, so, uh, first of all, this person I think is taking their opportunity to uh, address the entire room. Uh, are there any builders, developers that were invited today or just showed up? Could they speak to what would make them build denser more affordably? Okay. Uh, what role do you see public housing organizations playing in creating more equitable and affordable density? And this one was speaking uh, directly to uh, the issue of uh, being a co-conspirator as opposed to an ally mm -hmm. and wanted to cite uh, a couple of organizations Nakai Native Program, and I, I believe, and I apologize if, if I don't get your handwriting totally correct, uh, North, Northwest International, uh, Com I'm sorry, say it again. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, what he said. Uh, Northwest Intentional Communities Association. Um, so I feel like, you know, in, in reviewing the comic cards, people were really resonating. Um, with a larger, lar the larger macro issues that are driving uh, the conditions that we're facing. Um, I'm, I guess I'm a little curious about how that's gonna play out in the breakout sessions, what, how that's gonna shape the conversations. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, as we sort of wrap this up, um, you know, this has been a conversation between four people on stage, uh, breaking the fourth wall, you know, the audience, you know, in this thing is always an important dynamic you know, um, and we're always struggling with how to bring the audience into the conversation uh, in a way that's effective in the time that we have. Uh, the breakout groups are, are an opportunity for you guys to really sort of dig in and, 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 and pick apart both the things that you've heard here and the things that have sort of been burning in your hearts and your minds as you listen and the things that brought you here. Um, are there any closing comments that people want to sort of punctuate this conversation with? Can I, say, can I say a yeah. thing about for-profit developers? So, um, <clears throat> I have nothing nice to say. Um, I think, um, I, have, I have no idea if there are any in the room. Um, I don't think we've talked about inviting them in our planning sessions. 
Uh, but I do, and I, and I have an experience of one who refuses to engage with community, and I think that is like a privilege to be able to like come, tear something down, change an entire neighborhood, get rid of people, and still not be accountable to that community. Um, and I think like this, like um, Department of Neighborhood and um, the department that gives you permits, uh, SDCI, um, construction and inspection are doing this thing where they tell people who are developing in, in the neighborhoods that we work in to like call these organizations. Like there's like a long list of organizations that people can just call and we didn't consent to be on that page. There's not really like, if we tell you don't build here, there's no like the city being like, oh, you talk to the community, they don't want it, cool, you gotta go. There's like no like actual, we have no control over what happens. They just wanna continue to use our labor and bring people out and people always say, don't change my neighborhood, don't make me leave, and then they go and they do the same exact thing, right? So there's a lot happening there and I think there could be a lot more, there should be a lot more involvement with the city, um, with those private developers, right? Like there is, a, we live in a capitalistic society so people have the right to make money, but, and I put quotes there because there should, that shouldn't be the thing that we worry about, it should be that people have the right to places to live and I wanna urge the city and not like, I don't wanna call you out because that's mean, um, but like, you know, all levels of the city, city council, mayor, everybody to be accountable to that and to, and I'm gonna say, to force for-profit developers to engage with community in a way that's meaningful and that we have control over what, like, what happens there, right? I don't wanna just come and share my whole, like, my whole pain and everything, you just like mine me for information and then leave and still build the building that doesn't include people who look like me, people who have disabilities, people who can't afford to do it, and then you just, I don't want it to be business as usual. So if there are any in the room I want to like talk about that later, that's cool. I can like I can do this today. Um, but like don't call us and then let it go and still continue to build the way that you've been building. Okay. Well, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, I just want to say uh, I mean, there probably are things that the, the city can do to better sort of incentivize, require, allow for-profit developers to build, um, you know, more appropriate housing, more diverse housing. Um, I guess what I wanted to close on is just, um, you know, there's the problem of resources, but I just think that we also just need to get a lot more creative about taking housing off the private market um, and, and building in, in creative ways. So, because right now that basically looks like nonprofit housing developers building low income or affordable housing. Um, but there's so many more things that we can be doing, right? Like publicly owned housing, not just low income, but how about publicly owned market rate housing, right? So that we as, as the public have more control over creating vibrant mixed income neighborhoods. You know, community land trusts, co you know, cooperative, cooperatively owned, community owned um, development. And you know, I think there's a lot of interest in that at the city and among uh, community organizations, which is great, but I think we just need to keep pushing that further and we need to get the resources to, to plow into it. All right, well, with that, I think we're gonna wrap up this panel and uh, I guess y'all know what to do next, right? Yeah. No, oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> to continue exploring those creative solutions. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, we're, we're gonna move into breakouts where we'll have an opportunity to really dig into the topics that were raised today um, and also like engage with each other and start to do more processing and brainstorming and shared learning. Um, so there are ushers who I believe are silhouettes out in the lobby right now. Um, and they'll take you to the different rooms where the breakouts are. Oh, goodness. Thank you, Scott. I'm just gonna repeat that to make sure everyone hears it off the mic. Um, so, third time's the charm. There is a 15 minute break, um, and then we'll go into the breakout session. There's uh, refreshments downstairs in the fellowship hall, and we can all walk down there together and show you where it is. There are also ushers out in the lobby. Thank you, everyone. And the ushers are wearing green armbands. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.